You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. Actions could have taken place to stop the erosion of faith. Fences could be put up to keep the world out. Warning signs could have been set, walls put to keep the enemy and maintain the fortress. As the church, we have to remember, we have an enemy who is out to get us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He never sleeps. He never stops. But we sometimes sleep and we stop. And that's what Jesus was warning against. Have you ever felt pressured by culture to change who you are? Have you ever bent on what you know is right because of what people tell you should be done? In today's message, Pastor Ken wants you to know that you can't let your beliefs be worn down by the world. The enemy will always tempt you and try to make you change your beliefs. Don't let him in. The worldly pressures will never stop, and Jesus will never stop fighting for you. Seek after him and be strong in who you are through Christ. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Revelation chapter 3 as he continues his message, Autopsy of a Dead Church. If you're looking for Jesus every day, some things that Satan throws your way, you might not interest you because, well, Jesus could come back. I don't want to do that. He could come back today. I remember the pastor used to tell me, he says, if you're watching a movie this weekend, you know, Jesus could, co- could come back and you, you, you're going to find yourself in a movie house being brought back, going up to see Jesus. I, my mind is just like Pastor Dan's. How'd the movie end? You know, I, that, that doesn't really scare me. But the thing is, is that there are other things that do. And, you know, would I like to have Jesus come back while I'm busy doing that? No, not really. No, I don't think so. Many times just being watchful and looking for him keeps us from sin. It just does. It it keeps us from failing. Now, it's not a requirement to pay attention to their Christian walk. It's to be aware of what's going on around them. It's to be aware that Jesus is coming soon. It's to be aware of the times they live in. Now, he's telling a church 2,000 years ago to be watchful, to be looking for Jesus. There is nothing that should happen to stop Jesus from coming. I mean, there, there's no precondition for the rapture of the church. There just none exists. And when you start looking at the other things that are coming that the scriptures say have to happen before this, that, or the other, and we'll, we'll cover some of it, a lot of that's already happened. The deck chairs have been moved around. There's nothing stopping. All it takes is just the Holy Spirit being removed, and all of a sudden things can happen. I mean, worldwide trade? Yeah, got it. Television? Yeah, got it. You can see anything anywhere in the world at any point in time and communicate instantaneously anywhere. Has the gospel gone to every nation? Yes, and what the Bible translators say it's going to be translated in every language by 2030. So you start looking at things like that and you start wondering, do I need to be watchful today? And oh yeah, (laughs) we do. Many of the churches though, that the hallmark of the church today is to stay away from prophecy. Not a lot of churches will teach the book of Revelation or prophecy at all. They won't say anything about the soon return of Jesus. It's not something they're looking for. They're not looking for Christ to come back anytime soon. They're anti-rapture, they're anti-prophecy. They teach the word, but that's just not one of the things that they're into. The great leaders of the Reformation were a term, I'm going to throw a term at you, it's all millennial. It means no millennium in terms of their eschatology or in terms of their view of future things. They did not believe that Jesus was going to return to planet earth and rule and reign for a thousand years. That started with a guy by the name of Augustine. But prior to that, they all believed that. And we believe that. But the Catholic Church picked up on what Augustine taught, and so did the, so did the Ref- Reformation Church. The natural result of a no-millennium viewpoint, and, and then by the way, then you turn around and you allegorize all the scripture. I mean, it means something, so you have to not have it mean exactly what it says, you have to give it a spiritual viewpoint, and you, you wind up not looking for Jesus to come anytime soon. This happened during the Middle Ages with Augustine again, and it was picked up by Luther and Calvin. They were more interested in how to be saved. They weren't interested in future things. 
And that really didn't start getting looked at until around the, 7th, the 18th century again. So from around 400 A.D. to about 1700 A.D., the church as a whole was not looking for Jesus to come back. In fact, there was a huge group of people who were looking for Jesus to come in 1000 A.D. And if you start looking through all the literature of things that were written around that time frame, they were greatly disappointed when they woke up on January 1st, 1001, and Jesus had not come back. And they were trying to figure out why. And that's why they all started moving towards this spiritualizing and amillennial viewpoint. Jesus didn't say anywhere in the Bible, I'll come back on January 1st, 1001. Doesn't say that. It says no man knows the hour or the day. And there have been numerous people who keep trying to predict that. I don't want to go into all the different names, but there's over 1,200 that I found already. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4 to 10, Paul talking, You brethren are not in darkness that the day would overtake you, like a thief, you being believers, those who are actually looking for Jesus. You're all sons of light and sons of day. We're not of night nor of darkness. Well, you take not of night, not, not of darkness, and you see what Jesus is threatening the church of Sardis, that they're going to be surprised when he shows up, and all of a sudden you're going, maybe they're not believers. Well, that, that's part of the problem. We're not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night. Those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober and having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we live together with him. What the church needs is they need to restore vigilance and maintain it when it comes back, when they restore it. Jesus is giving a formula for revival to this church. That's what he's doing. And he's saying, you've got to wake up. So there's five imperatives. The first one is be watchful. And don't stop watching for Jesus. That's the first one. That's the first thing we have to look for. So he moves on. So we wake on up, we wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. Strengthen the things that remain, okay? Whatever remained at Sardis out of whatever they had going on, whether it was people or institutions, they have to preserve it and put it on a firmer basis. They do. They have to strengthen it. Whatever was decaying, whatever was falling apart, they've got to remember that and, and strengthen it. Start to strengthen. And that's what the word actually means. Start to strengthen the verb itself means to support or stand something on its feet. So this is something that's laid down and they need to stand it back up and start strengthening it again. They have to establish it. They have to make it strong. They have to wake up. Now, as we look at the history of Sardis, well, one more thing, uh, it may be accomplished or be sought or commanded. It presupposes that Christians who are to be strengthened are under assault and in danger of becoming uncertain or slothful in their faith or walk. That's what that mean, word means as we also take a look at uh, some additional references. But wake up is a reference to the history of Sardis. Remember how Sardis fell two times past in their history? While everybody was sleeping, a guy would climb the side of the mountain, open the front gate, and let everybody in, and the army would, would, would capture the city. Happened twice. Happened two times. It was very well known in ancient history. Sardis had been captured two times because people were sleeping. And in both cases, they operated just like a thief would. So when we look at the scripture here where it says, the remaining things, waken up and strengthen the things that remain, the remaining things, it implies that, yeah, they started off real well, they had a faithful service at one point in time, but something jumped in the way and stopped them from continuing to grow in Jesus Christ. Don't know what that is. The Bible doesn't tell us. But something got in the way. It's impeding progress. And as a result, the name of Jesus, which they want to call themselves by, is an illegitimate term because they're not living like believers. They're not living for him. They're living totally different. 
those things which remained, the remaining ones are about to die. And they have to pick it up and begin again with whatever it was that they started. So when they were first saved, there was something that they did, something that they prayed, something that they believed. They got to go back to that. I mean, you know, we're not going back over here to Romans. Remember what it says over here in Romans chapter 8? You know, therefore there is now no... Con- no, we're not going there. We're going back to Jesus loves... The, God so loved the entire world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever... That's how far back they're going. They're going back to the beginnings of salvation. They have to go back to that. There are a few things that are still there and Jesus says, get them going. There's much that's wrong, but get those little things going and then expand on them as they start getting stronger. Sometimes there is just so much that's wrong, we got to find what's right, and then major on that. So if the only thing that's going right sometimes, I find in my Christian walk, is the fact that I actually spend time in the Word, I need to do more of it. And then, or it's prayer, maybe I should pray a little bit more whatever, what Jesus is telling them is whatever you've got that's going on right now, you need to do that, major on that, and then start expanding from that. It's not time to have a theological discussion on justification versus sanctification. It's time to find out what does it mean to be saved? The fact that even the little things are about to die shows that they've got to do this in a hurry. There is The the words connote a sense of speed necessary to correct this. Now, Jesus doesn't say repent just yet. He will say that. Because as you start making those corrections, you start, ma- you start majoring on those little things that are still right, you start realizing, well, wait a minute, I need to repent. I need to come back into relationship with Jesus. But he's going to get to that point. He'll talk about that. But as we major on what's right, we find other things that need to be corrected, we move on to those, and we find ourselves repenting. Otherwise, uh, it's incredibly overwhelming. You... you you know, it's kind of like the old, how do you eat an elephant? Well, one piece at a time. It gets back to the same thing. So of the five things that we got to do, number one, be watchful. Don't stop watching for Jesus. Number two, strengthen. Start to strengthen. Act fast. Move quickly. So we're going to strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. Jesus goes on further and says, I have not found that your deeds are completed in the sight of my God. They're just not. We get to the reason why the first two you got to do this have been presented. I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Does he say in the sight of your God? No. This is Jesus talking, and he can't even use that term with them because they're that far gone. He has to say in the sight of my God. If I got a message direct from Jesus that said, I want to know what the problems are, you know, I'd want to know what they are so I could fix them, right? I mean, if Jesus were to call you on the phone this afternoon and say, Ken, I found this problem. I need you to fix it right now. I would do it. That's what's going on here. Jesus was writing a letter to this church saying, here are some problems. You need to fix these now. I would would also pay attention to just how Jesus points them out, too. Now, remember... This is a church that has a reputation. They have very carefully put this reputation out there. Yes, I'm using marketing terminology because I've seen churches do this today. They put out a brand. They follow up on that brand. They make sure that the brand is consistent on all the platforms that they're using to include YouTube and Facebook, uh, their blog. Everything that they put out there, it repeats the same message. But if they're dead... What difference does it make? You know, they have the reputation, but not the name. And Jesus goes as far to say as, I've not found completed your deeds complete in the sight of my God. He doesn't say you're God. He could, but they're not not worshiping God. Don't know what they're worshiping. It's not the same God that Jesus served when he was here on planet Earth. Jesus is God. Jesus is differentiating He's doing it intentionally. When he has to point out that it's his God, there's a serious problem. And there's a problem with the church in Sardis. It's called erosion. A little bit of rain here, a little bit of rain there, things start washing away. 
and soon there's no support anymore for what originally was there. Things that could have been done to stop the erosion, like they did in, in Jerusalem where they put brick walls up or rock walls up, they didn't do it because they were too busy sleeping. We don't have to do this. We're rich. We're good to go. And then eventually they wind up building the city at the bottom of the hill. Everybody remembers the glory of the old city, and they point back to that. Well, the church is doing the same thing. The church is allowing itself to be eroded from the inside, and they're not doing anything to stop it. You know, it's like the church I went to growing up. When I went off to Bible school, there were some problems in that church. They had already kicked out one pastor, and they were getting ready to kick out another one. And you could see that the gospel wasn't being taught anymore. And they weren't giving anymore to missions. And they weren't, the, 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 the warning signs were there, but nobody was busy putting up brick walls to stop the erosion. They didn't. And now it's gone. It's just not there anymore. There were things that could have been done to stop it. You know, number one would be repentance, but people were too busy trying to posture to show how spiritual they were to have that happen. Everybody remembers the old glory of Sardis, and they point back to that. Everybody remembers the old glory of the Sardis church, and they point back to that, but it's in danger of not being there anymore. There's erosion taking place, destroying what was originally there. And that's the problem with churches around us today. There's erosion taking place. They look healthy right now, but underneath the foundation is beginning to erode away. Actions could have taken place to stop the erosion of faith. Fences could be put up to keep the world out. Warning signs could have been set. Walls put to keep the enemy and maintain the fortress. As the church, we have to remember, we have an enemy who is out to get us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He never sleeps. He never stops. But we sometimes sleep and we stop. And that's what Jesus is warning against. The death is impending. It's not total yet. It's still coming. It's still possible that life could return. Everything's not eroded yet. A shock is needed. Just a shock. Something to the heart to restart it. It's like when somebody's had a, had a problem with their heart, they get an electric shock and it gets things going again. That's what the church needs. They need some kind of shock to restore life. And for many churches today, unfortunately, the shock that's going to take place is going to be a shock that's alluded to in verse 3. Remember what you've received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, here it comes, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. That's the shock that's going to happen to a lot of churches around us. Jesus will come, and they'll wake up the next morning, and now you've got people trying to explain what happened. Because they weren't looking for it, they weren't following him, and Jesus comes back for his church, those who are following him. And they're not, they're not part of it. That'll be a shock. You know, to, to all of a sudden realize that everything he said in the Bible is true. And the very next morning when the news media is saying millions are missing, they interview the pastor of XYZ Church to find out what, what happened. Well, what do you think that person's going to say? That shock will turn many back to Jesus. But it's a sudden discovery that what he said is true. And it might be too late for some in that regard. Early Christians expected the speedy return of Christ to establish an actual kingdom on earth. He was going to reign for a thousand years. They really thought he was going to come back. And when he didn't return, their concepts shifted to amillennialism. And they started teaching that. It turns to a non-literal idea of the kingdom. They began to think that there'd be a worldwide experience of peace and righteousness due to the efforts of the church. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says everything's going to get worse. But that's what all millennialism teaches. Again, this is the church of the Reformation. This is what that church teaches. 
Unfortunately, that's most mainline denominations today. If I started naming names of some of these, you would know who they are right away. The lights are on, but the deeds and the necessary work have not been completed. They need revival. Amillennialism, or no millennium, is a system of theology which rejects the idea of any period of a thousand years, either before or after the return of Christ. They're not even looking for the return of Christ. It's not, not important to them. They're not looking for it. And they would like us to quit talking about it. And I'm not going to. Because I believe that Jesus Christ is returning very, very soon. This evening would be good. There's no expect expectation of the soon return of our Lord and Savior with this group. They're not looking for him. Verse 3, remember what you've received. Okay, So he's already said you need to wake up, you need to be watchful, strengthen, stand everything back up. And now he says, remember what you've received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. You will not know what hour I will come to you. The operative words here are remember, received, heard, and keep. And then I circled repent. So remember, received, heard, keep it, and repent. Those are, those are the operative words in this sentence at the very beginning. Remember is the command and the solution. The basis for renewal is to bear constantly in mind what did, what did you do when you first gave your life to Christ? What happened? What brought you to Jesus in the first place? Remember that. That's what he's saying. Remember what Jesus did for you. He saved me from a life of this. or a, a, He brought me from here. And he, for me, he saved me from being the best pagan I could possibly be. Other people have more out, interesting testimonies. And there are those who just, Jesus saved me. That's why I'm here today. We have to remember that. We have to remember what he did for you and what he did for me. That's what our testimony is. It's what Jesus did for me. When I tell somebody what Jesus did for me, and somebody wants to argue about the Bible and argue who God is, and I, they can't argue what Jesus did for me. They, they're sitting there going, like, I can't argue that. It's hard to do that. The basis for renewal is to bear in mind constantly what you received and heard when you first believed. We always have to remember that. Sometimes people will forget. You know, I, I remember hearing one pastor one time teaching, I've never had a drop of alcohol touch my lips. Well, I've probably touched everything else. Just, I have a bad attitude about that. Anyway. But that's what we have to remember, is what Jesus did for us. The word for remember in the Greek is the same word we use to obtain the English word mnemonic from, okay? Now we use mnemonic devices to help us remember things. And some of you will probably know this, Roy G. Biv, okay? Roy G. Biv gives you the, the, the lights, and the colors of the spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Uh, here's one for you that some people don't know, Gel, North Dakota. You know what that is? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that's the Torah. By the way, there is no gel in North Dakota. But it helps us to remember things. Those are mnemonics, okay? That's what this word remember is. It, it, it's to create something in here that helps us remember what, to continually remember what Jesus has done for us. You've been listening to a message from Revelation on the Unsafe Bible. Pastor Ken has been diving deep into this final book of the Bible. If you're into fantasy or sci-fi, you might be naturally drawn toward Revelation. There's all kinds of imagery and strange creatures that are described. But more than any of this, you're reminded of the preeminence of God and that He rules over everything. He rules over all people, nations, and he has more power than the evil that can try to take over the world. What a relief that you can know and trust in this God. Are you confused about anything you heard today? Don't hesitate to contact us. You can get in touch with us by going to theunsafebible.com. Once there, go to the Connect tab and click on Connect Card. 
Then you can fill out a form for us to get in touch with you. To listen to this message or any others from this series in Revelation, just look under the media tab at the unsafebible.com. You'll also find additional teachings in other books of the Bible. If you found this ministry to be a blessing to you as you've been listening, you have the opportunity to help support the Unsafe Bible Ministry by checking out the Give tab. We're grateful for any donation given to help further the message of the gospel. Any other questions? Feel free to explore the unsafebible.com. For more information about when and where we meet, we're based out of Jupiter, Florida, and would be happy to meet you. Join us again here for another message from the book of Revelation on the Unsafe Bible.